I'm heading north, going back in time. Several centuries ago, this area of land was under the sea. Today, these are pastures where domesticated animals roam semi-freely between the dunes and the marshes, living in symbiosis with their environment. It's a far cry from intensive feedlots and is known as extensive farming. We've already reached an interesting landscape. Look at those sheep. They must be Scottish blackface sheep. There are dunes, so the sea is over there, and over here is a lake. Apparently, there is a nature reserve in the lake. A very early breed of horses is reared here, which I'm interested in. I love catching frogs. Look how beautiful they are. These ones are a reddish color, red and black. This one looks as if it's been painted. It's a golden-eyed Scottish frog. And there is a flock of lapwings. They are wading birds who inhabit grasslands. These migratory birds used to be shot for game. There's even a French saying, until you've tasted lapwing, you haven't had a tasty morsel. And there are sheep in the middle, as if humans had never set foot here. And yet the sheep wouldn't be here if humans hadn't brought them here. These are mountain sheep from the Mediterranean. They still live in rocky mountain areas, but after several thousand years of domestication, they're also found here, in the wetlands. They weren't made to survive in this climate, but they've been adapted and selected so that they can withstand the damp and the salty sea spray. It's amazing. Domestication is a cultural and historical human venture. A few kilometers away is a rather special nature reserve. Here in the middle of the marshland lives a handful of conic horses. They are direct descendants of Tarpan wild horses from Eurasia. They are looked after by Richard, who runs the reserve and is passionate about this area of outstanding natural beauty. He and his team are fighting to preserve it. They're mostly common terns. Yep. Uh, there's a few pairs of black-headed gulls there as okay. well. But also, really excitingly, there's one pair of little gulls. Oh, great. Only pair ever. Ever? Oh. Ever. To be proven breeding in Scotland. Oh, great. We are quite excited. Yeah. <laughs> So These are there. water scorpions. They are aquatic insects and they are synonymous with a healthy river. They have quite a powerful rostrum, which liquefies their prey so they can literally drink it, so it's best to avoid getting stung. It realized I meant it no harm. Look, that's beautiful. Amazing. It's beautiful. They are emerging from the vegetation. I think some are lying down. Yes, they're lying down. I read that horses sleep for about seven hours a day. Why? Because they're always on the lookout, and their main line of defense is flight. The foals are much lighter in color than the adults. Apparently, the wild tarpon horses, which disappeared from Eurasia and the rest of the world, had the same coloring. They inherited it from their extinct wild ancestors. Look at that stripe. It's most pronounced on their backs, but there are also stripes on their legs, and they have a two-tone mane. If we say that these are as similar to the wild horse that was here 10,000 years ago, yeah. then all the domestic breeds, the fell ponies, the highland ponies, the okay. exmoor ponies, all descended from horses that looked very, very similar to these. Okay. Some breeds have disappeared and mm. others are not quite as numerous as they once were, yeah. But horses still got quite a special place to a lot of, wow. a lot of people, yeah. There is no sign of human life here now. The reserve is a magical place, cohabited by numerous species. It radiates a sense of harmony, and the river adds a certain poetry. Ah, 
People talk about convergent evolution. In other words, two animals which are not very closely related, the yak being a different species to the cow, yet there is a morphological similarity due to a parallel process of adaption. Both animals needed a thick coat to protect them from the cold, wind and snow. So there is a physical resemblance, despite the fact that the cow and the yak are two different species. Great hair, that one. That's a proper fringe. So here I am in the heart of the highlands. I'm really excited because I'm going to be crossing Loch Ness to continue my journey to the Shetland Islands in the far north of Scotland. I've always wanted to go out in a boat on Loch Ness and Stuart is going to show me the lake's underwater fauna. Here goes. Hey, Stuart. Yeah? Yeah. Lovely weather. Very Lovely fine. Weather. Jump in, yes. Oh. Can it be, like, dangerous to navigate in Loch Ness? It's quite rough, just mm. like the sea at times. OK. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's I'm not exactly that. reassuring, okay. but OK. Right. Get the boat started up, and then we're good to go. Now we are free. Yes, we're free. <laughs> Loch Ness is 36 kilometres long and Scotland's biggest lake in terms of volume. It owes its fame to its 240 metre depth, which gives rise to plenty of mystery surrounding the fauna that inhabits it. There are seawater as well as freshwater species, both migratory and sedentary, and lots of people keeping an eye on its waters, shores and any signs of life in it. I've lived here for 22 years. Really? Um, you're a son of the loch. Something like that, Almost. yes. You see lots of strange things on it. You see animals that wouldn't normally be in here. Sometimes you can see a seal, for instance. The biggest volume of water in, okay. in, in Britain. It's 26 miles long, and it could be down to 900 feet deep. Wow. Gosh. Hey. A fisherman's toolkit. Wow. A real treasure trove. It's great. It's great. So, so good. So, so good. Yeah. When Ferex come in to look at one of these lures, for instance, wow. this one, Brutal. You, you, you can actually see the, wow. see the teeth marks on it. Really? From a previous fish. Teeth I'm marks from a ferox trout. It went for the bait, then it was probably killed with a trident. Then you put the biggest one to our... I'm very confident today. <laughs> right, just keep us, going to, keep us going out this direction, okay? okay I've got it. I'm at the helm, so this is starting to get serious. Wow, look at that. 200 meters of line. This is serious. Just a case of sitting and waiting. Do you mind if I keep looking on the surface if maybe no. I see something bigger? That's fine. No okay. problem at all. And Stuart, have you already seen something on the lake? Many times. What could it be, like a mammal or a plesiosaurus? It's a possibility. It's a possibility. It's a yeah, it's a possibility. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I'm on the lock most days of the week. I'm in a position where I'm going yeah, to yeah. see things. What do you see? It's usually some form of splashing. When you see splashing, you are sure that, as you know very well the fishes, that it's not a trout or a salmon. No, no. Salting. No. no. Jumping. No. no, no. No. Keep it tight. Up. Keep it really yep. tight. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's something there. Oh, yes. Great. Sea trout. Whoa. Right. Yeah. Hold on. Just, just while I get these in. Oh, the man, That's amazing. Exactly this is a sea mer. trout. But this fish has come from the sea to spawn in the river. It has this bluish silver color, which is in the process of turning green, so as to pass unnoticed in the dark waters of Loch Ness. I'll take a small scale sample from it. Yeah. And I'll, I'll send the scale to the department that ages fish. There. Now it's time to release it. There it goes. <gasps> Straight. Yep. Very good. Excellent. Thank Love you. <laughs> what will you do with the scales you took? I'll send them away to the local fishery department okay. for analysis. The results will show what the fish has been eating, okay. um, whether the fish has been to sea or not, yeah. and how long it's been living in fresh water. Wow. Let's see what we can observe.
Okay. Thank you, Stuart. No problem. Take care, all Bye -bye. Thanks. Here I am, in the highlands, north of Loch Ness. I'm going in search of the primitive breeds that live in these parts, and I also want to explore the ecosystems to be found here. Let's go. Beyond Loch Ness, Scotland is better known for its moors than for its ancient Caledonian forest, which is hardly surprising since it has virtually disappeared. Excessive deforestation and overgrazing are leading to the demise of a unique ecosystem, which is actually far more Scottish than the moors which have resulted from this huge decline of woodland. It is a disaster for biodiversity, but one man has been fighting to remedy it for over 30 years. The forest is his life. His name is Alan Watson Featherston, and he paints a grim picture. There was yeah. a forest here Dead, 50 yeah. years ago. Dead branches, more stumps over here. This is a ruined landscape. Mm -hmm. It's a wrecked ecosystem. Wow. And people think it's natural, and people think it's beautiful. The Scottish Tourist Board promotes beautiful treeless Scotland, wide open views. We've got very little forest left, yeah. and we've got far too many grazing animals, particularly red deer. Is it, the, so, is it what we call overgrazing? Exactly, yes. It's incredible. There isn't a single tree here, and yet there are deer droppings everywhere. Well, well, they're not that fresh. They're a bit fresher. Okay. When they're fresh, they're black and shiny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And these have dried up a little bit. But what's happened is we've taken away the predators. Yeah. So we have no wolves, we have no bear, no we have wolves. no lynx. They're all gone from Scotland. And the deer numbers have increased, and the forest has shrunk. So the deer have been eating their own habitat yeah, yeah, yeah. to death for 200 years. Do you recognize that it's a deer, red deer? Well, it's the, si the size of it. It's a stag, it's had antlers, yeah, you as you can see. Okay. And they, they cast their antlers every year and grow them again. Oh. So this animal has died here. There's a few other bones where we found this skull. Do you think it can be linked to the fact that there is no enough food for them? Almost oh, certainly, yes. Oh. The teeth are, you know, they're not that worn down, these teeth. Mm -hmm. You know, if it was old, they'd be really worn down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what are these little uh, insects that are harassing me at the time? <laughs> <laughs> these are the highland biting midge. 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 Okay. I believe they're another reflection of our broken ecosystem. Really? Because when you disturb and damage an ecosystem, and many parts of the ecosystem go, mm. some that are left that are opportunistic are able to multiply and spread. So the ecosystem is totally. If you think an ecosystem. Yeah, I see. Because all, with all these insects, I am starting to hate my own species. <laughs> if you tell me that the man is responsible of that <laughs> and of that. Yeah and of the presence, over-presence of the deer. Ah. The more we try to control and manipulate nature, the more it eludes us and turns against us. Unless people start listening to Alan, these ancient forests will be no more than a distant memory. This is the ultimate find for me, having crossed these desolate moorlands that are so characteristic of the highlands. Come face to face with a species that is typical of the far north, the black-throated loon. It's a bird with a slender body, a head like a dragon, and a needle-shaped beak. It is very delicate, black with white checks on its back, and a velvety grey head. Extraordinary. The numbers are dwindling. I think there are only a few dozen pairs nesting here in Scotland. Let's not disturb them any longer. <laughs> 